have Alistair, who is going to talk to us about making intelligent insights at the edge. I'm going to let him, him do the talking. <laughs> Lights, camera, action. Thank you. In our industry, we, are, we tend to think far more about the future than the past. The very nature of what we do means that we obsess about now and next, rather than trying to put things into proper historical context. And that, as it turns out, is sort of a mistake. So every once in a while, it's a good idea to take a breath, step back, and look at history and decide whether we really want to repeat our mistakes and our triumphs just one more time, or decide instead that we should go off and do something else entirely different. Because let's be clear, we've been here before, back in 2011. 2011 was, by any measure, the dawn of the big data era. Back in 2011, there were new tools appearing, new levers to move the world. We all got a bit excited. I talked, in fact, at one of the first big, big data conferences, which, not coincidentally, was also in 2011. I didn't talk about big data, mostly because none of us really understood what it was at the time. Instead, I talked about machine learning. No one was particularly interested in that, so that shows you what they knew at the time. Anyway, the next year I keynoted the conference again. I didn't talk about big data at that time either. Instead, I talked about small data and how you could stick it together to make bigger data. And all these years later, it turns out that well, it, the small data systems might be about to take over. M more on that in a bit, once it's, obviously, well, once it's obvious why that's happened and what's gone wrong. Because let's be totally honest with ourselves. As an industry, we have failed to bring people along with us. We have engineered increasingly intricate data collection, storage, and correlation systems. Our carefully crafted websites harvest data as a matter of course. We're proud of how much analytical data we can get from the users that visit our sites. We have dashboards, we have lakes, we have silos. And it doesn't matter, because outside of this room, this conference, and this industry, our industry is universally viewed as a dumpster fire. And nobody is coming to put it out. A McKinsey survey earlier this year asked CXO level executives if the company had achieved any positive returns at all from their big data projects. Just 7% answered yes. That isn't going to sit well with them. It doesn't bode well for the long-term health of our industry, and it doesn't bode well for our jobs. At least if we keep doing the same thing we've been doing since 2011. And this isn't even the real problem right now. Mark Zuckerberg famously stated that privacy should no longer be considered a social norm. And for the last 10 years, it has been the mantra of our entire industry. Everything we have built has had, at the bottom, the assumption that people don't care about their privacy anymore. I think it's fairly well known, at least to some of you in the audience, that I think that this attitude to privacy is never going to survive in the long term. That the current age, where privacy can no longer be assumed, that it's not a social norm, could not survive the arrival of the Internet of Things. Turns out I was wrong about that. While a serious privacy backlash has started, it wasn't the Internet of Things that started it. Instead, it was machine learning. Taking a real step back, a lot of the problems we're seeing with the internet today are due to how the internet was built. And the arrival of a new application, a new service that broke some of the underlying assumptions, the expectations of the people that wrote the standards that put the internet together. Well, it's hardly new. It's been 25 years, no, 26, since this application arrived. Because, it, yes, it's been 26 years now since the birth of the web, which changed the internet forever. I still rather vividly remember standing in a drafty computer room with half a dozen other people crowded around a sun spark station with a black and white monitor, looking over the shoulder of someone who had just downloaded the first public build of Nazca Mosaic via some torturous method. I remember shaking my head and going, it'll never catch on. Who wants images? Which perhaps shows what I know. But the arrival of the web broke the internet that sits underneath it, because there really is only one business model on the modern web, and that's advertising. 
People have consistently refused to subscribe to services or for pay for content. Instead, advertising supports the services that sit underneath almost everything we do on the web. And behind advertising is the data that makes that possible. Think about how your day-to-day how your -day experience of the web would be different if Google charged a monthly subscription fee, or perhaps worse yet, used a micropayment-based approach on a search-by-search -search basis. I certainly wouldn't add up two two-digit numbers together in the Google search box, which I'm sure all of us have done at one point or the other. A series of almost accidental decisions or circumstances have led to a world where things on the web appear to be free. That doesn't mean they are free. It just means we pay for them in other ways. Our data and our attention are the currency we use to pay Google for our searches and pay Facebook for keeping us in touch with our friends. Whether you view that as a problem is, of course, a personal choice. But it was perhaps not unanticipated. With no idea of the web, which was still years in the future, the people that built the internet did think about that possibility. This, from Alan Kay, written in 1972, who anticipated the black rectangle of glass and brushed aluminium that lives in all of our pockets today. And the ubiquity of the ad blocking software we'd need to make the mobile web even a little bit usable. If you have time, I heartily recommend tracking down Kay's writings. There, there really is a lot of value there. Because despite our obsession in technology with every new toy that comes along, there is really ne nothing new under the sun. Well, Alan Kay's prediction of the existence of smartphones is, in fact, almost prophetic. It was also, in a way, naive. It was a simpler time without the ubiquitous panopticon of the modern world, without the security threats, which arguably shapes the modern internet and our view of it. Just last month, fingerprints from over one million people, as well as facial recognition information, unencrypted usernames and passwords, and personal information for employees was discovered on a publicly accessible database for a company used by the Metropolitan Police, various defense contractors, and many banks. The data was from the web-based Biostar 2 biometric lock system, which allows centralized control of access for facilities like warehouses and office buildings. Biostar 2 uses fingerprints and facial recognitions as part of the means of identifying people attempting to gain access to the buildings. But what makes this leak worse than a lot of leaks that you hear about is that the, despite, you know, it was unprotected and almost unencrypted, it was actually storing the actual biometrics themselves, not hashes. It's an horrendous leak. Facial recognition and fingerprint information cannot be changed. Once they're stolen, it can't be undone. You can't change your fingerprint. Anyone can pretend to be you. And to be clear, for those of you who go, oh, it's a digital representation, building fake fingerprints is actually a thing, and it's not that hard. A bit of epoxy, and I can do it in my home office. Just last week, hundreds of millions of phone numbers linked to Facebook accounts were found online. The exposed server contained 419 million records, affecting 133 million people in the US and 18 million people here in the United Kingdom, as well as millions of other people across the globe. The phone numbers would directly link to Facebook ID, it's something that's easily scrapable from the web no matter what your privacy settings are. The server the data was found on wasn't protected with a password. Anyone could find and access the database. It puts each and every person at risk of just of spam calls, but also SIM swapping attacks, which relies on tricking cell carriers into giving the person's phone number to the attacker. And of course, with someone's phone number, an attacker can force reset the password on any internet account associated with that number, even if you have SMS two-factor authentication uh, turned up email accounts, bank accounts. How many of your banks send you an SMS message when you try and make a withdrawal? Lots. The data appears to be a year or two old, and nobody really seems to, seems to be sure who scraped this particular data set in the first place. Which Facebook app is responsible, or why it was just sitting there unprotected online? And breaches like this are now so common, it's unlikelihood nobody is actually going to go and look. You might dismiss these as anomalies coming from people or places that haven't done it right. And I admit, they really haven't. But we all know that isn't it. Right now, a week can't pass without something like this, some breach or leak turning up in the news. 
And it's not if this, these, as if these leaks are happening to companies that shouldn't know better or obviously go, uh, going, obviously going to go out and cut corners. Everyone has heard of, got mentioned earlier, in fact, the st and stands a good chance of being in the 2017 Equifax breach. Millions of driving license numbers, phone numbers, email addresses were exposed directly connected to, connected to names and dates of birth. 143 million people in the United States were affected, and as it later turned out, 15 million people here in the United Kingdom, including me. Yay. And even if you avoided that one, congratulations. I guarantee you're in the Marriott Starwood breach that came to light last year. 500 million people, name, gender, address, phone number, email, passport number, date of birth, and the arrival of and departure information of your hotel stays. If you've ever stayed in her Sheraton or any of the many other brands that made up the Starwood chain before they were bought by Marriott, then your details are in this leak. These are not small companies. They will have a full blown data architecture teams, DevOps teams, rules, procedures in place. Neither Equifax or Marriott are startups throwing things into an AWS instance and figuring to fix everything a little later down the line once their Series A comes in. They have the headcount and the money to do it properly, and they didn't. And if these companies didn't, are your companies doing it properly? Probably not. And finding data leaks doesn't seem to be even that hard anymore. You just have to poke around for open Amazon S3 buckets. There's open source code on GitHub that does it automatically. It's not just Sil Silicon Valley, though. 200 million Chinese CVs exposed on a cloud server in January this year, close on the heat details of 5 million Chinese rail travelers. It's a worldwide problem. The existence of Have, Have I Been Pawned is great, but it's not a good thing. It's an indicator of the dumpster fire burning quietly in the background. And it's not just big data, it's small data. Again, back in 2011, which in hindsight turned out to be a fairly pivotal year for the industry, there was this. It was one of the first big mobile privacy scandals, possibly the first. It even got a name, the press called it Location Gate, and it sort of was my fault. It was quickly followed by at least four class action lawsuits that I know about in countries ranging from Canada to Taiwan, a US Senate hearing, and an operating system release to patch the problem. It was just a bug in the iPhone operating system, a cache file that wasn't being swept like it was supposed to. The bug allowed data to build up and build up, generating a record of everywhere you'd ever been, every cell tower you'd ever passed since you first started using that particular revision of the operating system. It even persisted across phones. If you changed your phone and restored your backup the new phone uh, to a new phone, this database came with it. Everyone with an iPhone had almost a year of data on their phone before I stumbled across this. This is what my movements around the, the south of England looked like that year. And eight years on, we are no further forward. In fact, if anything, we're far worse. These days, Location Gate wouldn't even be a story, let alone a worldwide news. I'm not sure I'd even write it up for a blog post. This is something that broke last year, but it's still going on in places. It turns out that not only are cell carriers sharing our location data with third parties in real time, some people they're selling it to, the data aggregators, are taking such poor care of it that you can track anyone's location. One site had a try before your buy page that let you test the accuracy of the company's data. While the page theoretically required explicit permission and consent from the user before location data was revealed through a one-time text message, and we all know how well it was protected those are, the website had a bug that allowed anyone to track anyone else's location absolutely silently, without their permission, in real time. A bug, in fact, that may well have exposed nearly every cell phone customer in the United States and Canada, that's over 200 million people, to having their location tracked silently and continuously in real time for months, if not years. Eight years between a, a leak so egregious it made worldwide news and our industry uploading the same data into the cloud and exposing it through sloppy security to just about everyone in real time. Haven't we done things better? And soon, every piece of clothing you wear and everything you carry with you will be measuring, calculating, and weighing your life. It won't just be your phone. Every car you ride in, every lamp post you pass in the street will be collecting data. And I'm sort of starting to think we shouldn't be uploading that to the cloud anymore. 
This is an amazing and really intriguing data set that was obtained using a Freedom of Information request from the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. This is every taxi trip in New York from January 2009 through to the middle of 2017. Um, it's online, you can download it, it's really, inter it's really interesting. The data includes pickup and drop off times, location, trip distances, itemized fares, passenger counts, and even how the passenger paid. Since it's released, people have built some amazing visualizations from the data, but there's a big problem. The personal identifiable information, the driver's license number and taxi number wasn't anonymized properly. You can easily tell which driver drove which trip. Worse yet, at least from most people's point of view, passenger identities can be de-anonymized through GPS harvesting. It's always hard, but I actually argue it's pretty much impossible to properly anonymize a location-based data set of this sort of size. You can find out how celebrities tip by cross-correlating cab numbers in paparazzi photos of the celebrities with the trips logged in the released data set. However, even if you ignored the poor put upon celebrities, multiple pickups at commonly frequented locations, a public building, a bar, a club perhaps, with drop-offs clustering around another location, say your home address, lets you find more regular people that aren't celebrities and identify them as patrons or customers of, shall we go with certain establishments. The last decade, decade can be summed up by this question. You are being watched. Are you okay with that? And our response, which is this. We haven't realistically given anyone a choice. As our new tools, those new levers in the world, came into widespread use, over the last decade, we've seen an increasingly aggressive and rapid erosion of our privacy. Because privacy isn't about keeping things private. It's about choice the choice of what I tell you about myself. And in a way, the GDPR is our own fault as an industry. A reaction to the egregious fashion we as an industry handled the introduction of the original cookie law. The now ubiquitous, this site uses cookies banner that runs across almost every website on the planet may meet the letter of that law, but it violates the spirit. It ignored the point of the regulation, which was an attempt to protect consumers, end users. And it really annoyed the European Union. And of course, we're doing it again. The technological fix rather than a cultural shift. This is not in the spirit of the GDPR. I don't care if it complies with it. It's not in the spirit of the GDPR. I'm not even really sure it is, does comply with it. And anyone that tells you it is, is lying because no one really knows yet. And this is arguably worse. A click through with a single OK button and some disguised and disingenuous links to the site's privacy policy that if you dig far enough down, do actually let you fix your cookies. We can always guarantee you that this doesn't meet the letter, let alone the spirit of the GDPR. And the ironic thing here is that opting out of cookies get, puts, more yet, puts more cookies on your browser. Telling you to stop tracking needs you to log in, which means they don't need the cookies in the first place to track you. That's what irony means, right? Which brings us right back to the dumpster fire and the GDPR. I'll go as far as saying that anyone, I'll go as far as saying that the GDPR compliance industry is snake oil. And to be clear, to imply someone is hawking snake oil is not only to call their product low quality garbage, it implies that they are knowingly defrauding customers to sell them junk. Because the GDPR is actually pretty simple if you decide you want to abide with the spirit of the law, rather than trying to find some technological or legal loophole to go around it. The GDPR people gives people rights that as an industry, I think we're ignoring. As an industry, I think we're laughing at. You should be able to access your own personal data for free. You should know and understand what's happened with your data and why. Without compelling reasons to keep your data, then the organization should delete it automatically without you asking. You can obtain and reuse your personal data with other services and providers. You can stop to direct marketing and data processing when there is no compelling reason to do it. 
You can block and put restrictions on how your data is used, if it's accurate, uh, whether it's accurate or unnecessary. You can update any data that's about you that is out of date or false. And rather interestingly, users can stop automated decisions being made about them if it has legal or significant consequences. And this sort of solution isn't going to work much longer. California just passed the CPPA, which is tackling the exact same problems as the GP GDPR. The point, the clock is ticking on companies that are doing this. And really, the GDPR represents the minimum level of respect your users' data that you should expect from a company. If you have problems fitting your company's use of user data inside the GDPR, and by that I mean the spirit, not the letter, then it is you that has the problem, not the rest of the world. You are the dumpster fire. On the whole, if you feel you have to hide something from your users so you can get away with it, it's probably unethical. It may now be illegal, and if it isn't, it should be. Like this, for instance. This is an actual screenshot from an actual app controlling actual smart light bulbs. Like some US-based sites, this particular light bulb's just stopped working when the GDPR came onto force. You can still turn individual bulbs on and off, one at a time, but everything else gets taken away if you tell the app you refuse to accept their privacy policy. Which makes you wonder, what data about when and what bulbs you're turning on or off is the company behind the app selling on or using in ways you really wouldn't want them to? To, to be clear, I'm fairly sure this response isn't legal under the GDPR. You can't refuse to provide a service just because the user refuses to let them have their data unless the data is necessary to provide the service. And I cannot conceive of a single case where GDPR, GDPR infringing data is necessary to turn light bulbs on and off. Can anyone in this room think of a single? I, I just can't think of anything. Which brings us to now and next, and the next internet, the one made of things. Here we have a chance to start again, and we haven't, at least not yet. A few years ago now, it was discovered that the company behind Cloud Pits, essentially an internet-connected teddy bear, had left the database again exposed publicly to the internet without so much as a password to protect it. The database, in the database are references to 2.2 million voice recordings of parents and their children. And then using these references, you can retrieve the actual rec voice recordings from an open Amazon S3 bucket, or you could. This person that originally discovered this tried to contact Cloud Pets three times to warn them and did not get a response. Then this database was subject to a ransomware attack, which on the whole was a good thing, I guess, because at least it got it offline. Exposed services, misconfigured services fall out from our industry for the most part, and now so common there's even a search engine for this stuff. This was a search I did for a specific brand of webcam that ships out of the box misconfigured so the camera feed is publicly accessible. There are feeds from shops, offices, storage rooms, gardens, of people living their lives, making breakfast in um, South Korea. The data generated by things, by network connected smart things, is almost invariably sent to the cloud right now, where it's carefully aggregated, packaged, and then usually sold. This model is forced on companies selling the thing because the other internet has made most consumers unwilling to subscribe to services. And while we might be willing to pay for the device itself, a physical thing that we can hold in our hands, we expect software and services to be free. Unfortunately, this has turned us into the product rather than the customer. Because there is no cloud, there is only other people's computers. And if we don't pay for them, someone has to. Which is a problem, because it's not just your email or the photographs of your cat, but your location to the centimeter, your heart rate, your respiration rate, not just how you slept last night, but with whom. The privacy and attention we're trading for our free services and content is now much more personal. A few years ago, iRobot, the, the company that makes the adorable Roomba vacuum cleaner, gave it the ability to map the your inside of your home while keeping track of its own location within it. Very useful. Then we found out they were preparing to share those maps of people's home with their commercial partners. And yes, you did give them permission for them to do that. You did read the terms and conditions before pressing I agree, right? No, I generally don't either. 
But it turns out people aren't quite as sure trading this sort of data for services is such a good deal anymore, especially when our free services come bundled with smart devices that we have to pay for with actual money. But it's not just the data the smart things create that's the problem. Metadata from the web traffic generated by things installed in your home can reveal a lot of information about your habits and lifestyle. Just looking at the traffic flow between the Internet of Things devices and their cloud services shows emerging patterns. Whether you're at home, whether you're sleeping, the footprint of your devices leave behind you tells a story. This is a really interesting piece of work done more than a few years ago now by um, Adam Sadlick, more than, uh, from the, I think he was at the University of Rochester at the time. I think, he's, I think he's now at Google. Anyway, he looked at Twitter users who routinely tagged their tweets with a location. He didn't care about the actual data, just the metadata, the location. He found that a couple of weeks of location data on an individual, combined with location data from just two of their most sharing friends, was enough to place the person with 100 meter accuracy 77% of the time. That rises nearly to 85% of the time when you can buy the information from nine friends. Even someone who has never, ever, ever shared their location data on Twitter can be pinpointed with 50-50 accuracy from information available from two friends and about 60% accuracy with nine friends. This was from last year. If you thought Stravia's heat map fitness data was properly anonymized, you need to think again. By manipulating um, the Stravia's API, it's possible to de-anonymize the company's data release and show exactly who was exercising where. Once someone makes a specific data request for a geographic location, a nuclear weapons facility, for instance, or an airport, it's possible to view the names, running speeds, and running routes, and heart rates of anyone who shared their fitness data within this area. And along with privacy is another real problem, ownership. As customers, we have, may have purchased the thing, but the software and services that make the thing smart remain in the hands of the manufacturer. The data that things generate belongs, generally, to the manufacturer, not the person that paid for the thing. Last year, year before, maybe John Deere told farmers that they don't really own their own tractors anymore, just the licenses for the software that makes them go. That means not only can they not fix their own farm equipment, they can't even take it to an independent dealer to get it fixed. They have to use um, a John Deere dealership. As a result, there's now a black market for cracked firmware for tractors on the dark web. How awesome is that? <laughs> firmware that doesn't lock down the tractor and gives the farmers the option to service their own tractor. The very idea of what it means to own something has changed. In, uh, for instance, hurricane, as Hurricane Irma bore down in Florida, Tesla, the electric car company, issued an over-the-air software fix for their cheaper car models in Florida that temporarily gave, the, temporarily gave the drivers an extra 30 to 40 miles range to help them escape the storm. The cheaper, software, the cheaper models have been software locked to use only 80% of the available battery capacity. The remaining battery capacity could be unlocked if you paid extra. As a result of this and many other things, nobody trusts us anymore. Nobody. Uber, for instance, decided to reverse its controversial move to track users even after their trip had ended. Uber decided to roll back the change after consumer backlash, saying they hadn't properly clarified what value consumers would gain. Perhaps because in the end, there was no value for the end consumers. We need to sit back and think about why we're doing what we're doing, what the big data industry is for, rather than just what those, those tools that came along in 2011. We, look to, we need to look at new tools that become available, because in the end, we never really wanted the data we harvested. We wanted the insights and actions the data could produce. Insights into our environment are far more useful than write-only data collected and stored for a rainy day in a lake or a silo. Which makes me think of something that Alistair Kroll, who chairs one of the, other, the bigger big data conferences, said all the way back at the start of this roller coaster ride. Big data isn't big, it's the interaction of small data with big systems. It might be time to disassemble those big systems we've just spent 10 years building, because I'm not sure we need them anymore. I'm not sure we need the cloud anymore, at least not everywhere. Over the last year or so, there's been a realization that not everything should be done in the cloud. I hope you have convinced you that it might not be the best idea. 
Now, for anyone that's been around for a while, this might not come as a surprise because, uh, surprise, because throughout the history of the industry, depending on the state of our technological readiness, we seem to oscillate between thin and thick client architectures. Either the bulk of our compute power is hidden away, somewhere far away, or is distributed in smaller devices around us. We're on the sw swing back again, away from large-scale systems which is where this comes in. This is a leading indicator. This is something called the Coral Dev Board from Google. Underneath the big, huge heat sink you see there is something called the Edge TPU. It's part of a tidal wave of custom ASIC that we've seen released to market over the last year, intended to speed up machine learning inferencing at the edge. No cloud needed, no network needed. Take the data, act on the data, throw the data away. And by speed up, I really do mean that. On the left, we have uh, the mobile net SSD model running on the Edge TPU. On the right, we have the same model running on the CPU of the dev board itself. Uh, that CPU is a quad-core ARM Cortex-A53, for those of you that means anything to. The difference is dramatic. Inferencing at around 75 frames per second on the left, and two frames per second on the right. No cloud needed, no network needed. And by tidal, made a tidal wave, I really did mean that too. This is only part of the collection sitting on my lab bench back at the office right now. On the market, we, at the moment, we have hardware from Google, Intel, NVIDIA, with hardware from many smaller, much less known companies coming soon or already now in production. Some of it designed to accelerate um, existing embedded hardware, like those USB sticks you can see attached to the Raspberry Pis here on the bench from Intel and Google, amongst others. Some are designed as a valuation board for system on modules, SOM units, that are going to be made available pretty much later this year, I think, to industrial customers, like the Coral Dev board itself that I talked about, or NVIDIA's Jetson Nano that you can see here in the middle. And over the last six months or so, I've been looking at machine learning at the edge, publishing a series of articles, trying to answer some of the questions people have been asking about inferencing on embedded hardware. And this is one of the major outputs. Benchmarks, everyone loves a good benchmark, right? Here we have inferencing in milliseconds for the MobileNet V1 SSD 0.75 depth model, left-hand bars, and MobileNet V2 SSD model, right-hand bars, both trained using the Common Objects in Context Coco dataset. Standalone platforms are shown in green, like the NVIDIA Jetson Nano or the Coral Dev Board. The single bars over here are for a software platform called AI2Go, uh, which is a quantized um, binary weight model that you can run on existing hardware like Raspberry Pis. Other measurements are for accelerator hardwares attached to Raspberry Pi 3s in yellow or Raspberry Pi 4s in red. Um, now, this is a whole other talk. Um, I almost, in fact, the talk I gave you today, but I really wanted to complain about data breaches, so I didn't. Um, the URL, on the other hand, is at the bottom right. Go read the article. But what it comes down to is the Raspberry Pi 4 is probably the cheapest, most affordable, most accessible way to get it started with embedded machine learning right now. Use it on its own with TensorFlow Lite for competitive performance, or with the Coral USB accelerator from Google for really best in class performance, <laughs> blisteringly fast performance. But while inferencing speed is probably the most important measure, these devices intended to do machine learning at the edge also need to pay attention to environmental factors. Designing smart objects isn't just about the software you put on them. You also have to pay attention to other factors, and especially concerned with heating and cooling and the power envelope, because it might be necessary to trade off inferencing speed against these factors when designing Internet of Things things. And the custom accelerator hardware that I've been looking at for the last six months really is the high end of the embedded machine learning stack. This is the, the board called the SparkFun Edge. It's a board that actually had something to do with at, at the beginning. It got spun up to act as, as the demo board for TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. It's built around an Ambic Micro uh, Apollo 3 microcontroller. That's an ARM Cortex M4F running at 48 megahertz with 96 megahertz burst mode operation. It has built-in Bluetooth. It uses somewhere between 6 and 10 microamps per megahertz, so around 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps running flat out, and draws about just one microamp in deep sleep mode with Bluetooth turned off. That's insanely low powered. For comparison, the Raspberry Pi draws 400 milliamps. 0.3, 400. That's a big difference. 
The SP32, if you know of that one, draws around 20 to 120 milliamps. And the closest comparison that I come across is the Nordic R R NRF 52840, which draws about 17 milliamp. The chip at the heart of this board runs flat out with a power budget less than many microcontrollers draw in deep sleep mode. And it runs TensorFlow Lite. Keep your eye on LED 47 here. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Real-time machine learning on a microcontroller board powered by a single coin cell battery that should last for months, even perhaps years. No cloud needed, no network needed, no private personal information ever leaves the board. At least in the open market right now, this is machine learning at the absolute limit of what our current hardware is capable of. It doesn't get any cheaper or less powerful than this. These tiny microcontrollers don't have enough power to train neural networks, obviously. However, you can run it in, infer, inferencing on existing models using tricks like model quantization. And this is TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers up and running inside the Arduino development environment. Arduinos? Anyone show of hands? Yeah, OK. Yeah, many people. There's actually two computing, uh, competing forks of TensorFlow Lite for Arduino, one from TensorFlow team at Google and another from Adafruit Industries in New York. Making TensorFlow available, making machine learning available from inside the Arduino environment is actually a big deal, bigger deal than you might think. It's a huge change in the accessibility of machine learning and the emerging edge computing market. It's going to be really fascinating to see if it, cha it changes the uptake. The arrival of hardware designed to run machine learning and models at vastly increased speeds and inside relatively, uh, relatively low powered envelopes without needing a connection to the internet or the cloud makes edge computing that much more attractive proposition. And with the release of TensorFlow 2.0, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, and of course the Arduino port, the ecosystem is starting to seem, well, sort of mature which means the biggest growth area in machine learning practice over the next year or two could well be around inferencing rather than training, <laughs> especially when you start thinking about inputs. Right now, the best sensors we have are cameras, and a lot of our machine learning models are designed around that. And TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers make it, if not trivial, at least easily done to put machine learning inside the power and processing envelope of existing available cameras, the type you see web cameras every day. But of course, it's not just cameras. Right now, your voice assistants are listening to you. So are the humans behind them. This has been a big scandal over the last month or so, or two months or so. <laughs> this is a speech-to-text engine called Cheetah from a company called Pico Voice. It runs inside the power and resource envelope of a Raspberry Pi Zero. No cloud needed. That means that, unlike most current voice engines where current conversation this conversation isn't going to leave your home. This is running on a Raspberry Pi Zero with no internet connection. Give me directions to the nearest gas station. Play a song by Bon Jovi. And your conversation I'm is not going to be monitored by humans for quality control for purposes. And meatballs. <laughs> and your like of meatballs. We're right at the start of a shift in the way we collect data and the amount of data collected. We're going to see a lot more data very, very soon. But most of it is going to live inside low-powered systems that don't have to be connected to the internet. The data doesn't have to go to the cloud. Instead, we can leverage new tools, machine learning models, and low-powered hardware now appearing in the market to run those models. New tools that make us make, let us make local decisions. Local decisions that mean the seemingly inevitable data breaches we see every day, every week now, aren't inevitable anymore because the data isn't centralized. I'll leave you with one more thing to think about. Earlier this year, Zuckerberg stood up on the, sta the stage at Facebook F8 conference and said, the future is private. And even if you don't believe him, and let's face it, we really haven't given, been given any reason whatsoever to ever believe anything this man ever says. 
The idea that this man, the man that 10 years ago stood up and sold us of the mantra of the big data age, that privacy was no longer a social norm, said this, tells us something. It tells us that that age is over. If we can give our users, our customers, our friends the choice not to share their data with us, and yet still give ourselves the ability to obtain and act on insights the data might give, that's not a bad thing. We don't need their data anymore to do it. At least we don't need to keep it. Moving what we can, what we can to the edge might not solve everything. There's always going to be a place for the cloud and central data collection. There always has to be. But it's a good start. So if you can, take the data, act on the data, throw the data away. Thank you. Wow. Oh, am I on? Oh, yes, I am. Have we got any questions for Alistair? Um, that was a great call to action for the industry. Um, it feels like as long as there are um, people prepared to do something more nefarious than you, they will. Um, yes. What, what, what's the solution from a... Legislation. Make them criminals and make them pay for it. It's as simple as that. The GDPR is the solution. The GDPR and laws like it are the solution. And uh, make, it, make it illegal for people to do criminal things, things that should be criminal. A lot, like a lot of the, the, the data breaches and the data leaks and the, 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 the egregious violations of privacy should be flat out illegal and the companies should have been fined far more than they ever were. As developers, we should sit there in our meetings and if someone asks us to do something that ethically we feel is bad, we should say no. And then if enough of us say no, then we don't need the laws. But there's always going to be people that say yes. So we need the laws. We need laws that are digital native, if you want to use the buzzword. We need laws that tell people that it's not OK to be unethical. Any other questions? I have one. Probably shot. All right. Uh, what happens then when the, uh, the, these things that you showed here are now the most important tools that politicians have to be elected than to make those laws? So what is that left for us citizens? I, th I think that's the, that's the big question of the modern age, isn't it? It's um, what can we do against the technology that we have built? Because let's face it, we have given the tools to the politicians to get them elected. We have caused the current political situation. We should not sidestep that. It is our responsibility as technologists, as developers. We have caused this. It is our fault. Does, that might make you uncomfortable, but that's the truth. It is our fault. Trump. Brexit, all of this, it's our fault. It's not anyone else's fault, it's us. We have done this to the world. Go away and think about that. Maybe there's no more questions then. <laughs> <laughs>